Hello, my geeselings. It is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 68. And this episode is with Simon Blackburn, who is recently retired, but before that was professor of philosophy at the University of Cambridge, and Edna J. Curry, distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So Professor Blackburn, uh, Simon, as I now know him, is a hugely influential philosopher, and he's worked in many areas of philosophy, as have many of my guests of late. But he's best known for his work in metaethics and the philosophy of language. And metaethics, though we do touch a bit on truth and pragmatic approaches to truth in relation to metaethics, end parenthesis, is the focus of this conversation. So we discussed first the distinction between ethics and metaethics, and in particular, with regard to the latter, we discuss whether there are moral facts, so facts of the sort it is wrong to lie, how we might know such facts, and then how these questions bear on the first order ethical questions of what we ought to do and how we ought to live. Then, more particularly, we talk about realism, anti-realism, and Simon's position that he elaborated and brought to the philosophical literature quasi-realism. And quite roughly, though there are debates just about about whether realism and anti-realism are even sens- sensible distinctions or sensical i don't know if sensical is a word i know nonsensical is a word uh if there if it's a sensical distinction to draw in ethics or in any uh, body of inquiry but realism might loosely be put as the belief that (laughs) there are these uh, moral facts and anti-realism an anti-realist might hold that there aren't moral facts Uh, one anti-realist position is expressivism and when we say something like it's wrong to lie we're really just expressing uh, a feeling like boo lying anyway so that's what we discuss in this episode it's great uh simon is i mean there are few people as well versed in this topic as he is and it really shows in the conversation and i should note though that there are a couple of minor audio glitches that I don't think should detract too much from the listening experience. And then, and that that's actually for those who are interested in the, the background of how these things go, that comes from recording on zoom. I use two platforms. One Riverside FM records locally to each computer as we're uploading, as we're um, talking and then simultaneously uploads that recording to the cloud. Whereas Zoom is constantly, as I understand it naively, is just sort of streaming things to the internet. And because it doesn't have this second step of recording locally, if there is any interruption in the connection, you lose information. So that's where these glitches come from. And then I've also been experimenting with some AI audio enhancement. And It works really well. So the raw audio, because we recorded over Zoom, was pretty bad, but it suddenly sounds really good now, except there are some quirks. So occasionally I might say, hmm, or Simon might say, hmm, but it like reads as a little chirp or something for some reason, and I wasn't able to get rid of all of those. Uh, But anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed talking with Simon. Your dissertation was on the problem of induction, and while I wasn't able to get a copy, I gathered that the work uh, falls into the philosophy of science. But then, two years later, you were already publishing on moral realism, and which makes me wonder, was moral philosophy always one of your interests from the time you started thinking seriously about philosophy? And the reason that I ask 
is that as far as I can tell, there are few philosophers who do both the philosophy of science and value theory. Though, of course, in your case, you've worked on many other things. Yes. Yes, I was always a bit of a magpie. Um, I mean, a, 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 a model here might, well, I didn't know him at the time, might be someone like David Lewis who worked on everything that came to hand, practically. Um, Bernard Williams was another, you know, um, very wide-ranging philosopher, um, talked about skepticism, about history of uh, philosophy, about ethics, of course. So, so I think there were those models, um, but the immediate catalyst was something different. It was, in the course of my studies on induction, I came across the uh, work of Frank Ramsey on probability, and that struck me as a absolutely fascinating and uh, sort of, in a sense, a, a beacon about a way a problem could be tackled. And um, I guess meta-ethics was in the air, and um, so I found it easy to say, well, look, here are some Here's some thoughts which derive from Ramsey on probability and uh, can be applied to the case of uh, moral judgments or ethical judgments. So that was the um, that was the immediate um, catalyst. Um, and I think uh, um, it was only after I wrote Spreading the Word in 1984, and that was 15 years later, that. Um, I became sort of notorious for my views on ethics as opposed to my views on anything else, including the philosophy of science. And um, um, there was then, you know, just the pressure of being invited to give talks on the ethics and then invited to defend my view and so forth that um, shaped the subsequent trajectory, which, um, as you say, was largely... Not so much in moral philosophy, that thought of as a first order discipline, telling you, you know, whether it's permissible to have right. abortions and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but in dealing with the um, the categories, we want to talk about morality in the questions of truth, questions of rationality, and so on. And well, this a... isn't a particularly, I mean, it's not a philosophical question at all, but uh, you mentioned Frank Ramsey. My well, favorite thing about Frank Ramsey is actually his middle name, which is Plumpton, um, yeah. <laughs> Frank Plumpton Ramsey. I always get a chuckle when I see that. That is a very uncommon name here it's in the very, States. Oh, it's it? a very uncommon name. Yeah, yeah I think it's a, uh, an old family name which got sort of folded into his full yeah. name. Plumpton. Okay, yeah. Frank no. Plumpton Ramsey is great. But so you mentioned uh, metaethics, which is what I wanted to talk about first, at least, uh, before maybe we have time to get into some of the, sure. the first order ethical questions, but most non-philosophers will have never heard the word meta-ethics before, let alone will even saying second-order questions about ethics make uh, sense to them. So how do you distinguish between ethical and meta-ethical meta yeah. questions at first blush? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's a question that's like many others have invited, has invited controversy. Yeah. Um, Somebody, and um, the most famous example, I think, is somebody who denied the distinction altogether, uh, was Ronnie Dworkin, um, the philosopher of law and ethics, yeah, uh, or in Oxford. Um, but I think he was wrong. I think there is a distinction. Uh, my own uh, way of drawing the distinction would be this, that um, in first order of ethics, we... Uh, or people try to tell each other what to do, to work out what virtue demands in the situation, to work out what it's best to do. Um, in other words, to solve all what I regard as essentially practical problems about how to live, how to live together, and social life should take place, um, and what are the prohibitions and the permissions that we need to recognize in order to do that successfully. Uh, that's first order ethics. Meta ethics or second order ethics, I don't care which term one uses, um, 
says, well, the, this is all very well, but it's, it's as if um, people are discussing it as if there's one truth about the matter, as if um, perhaps it can be found by reason. Uh, we can work out the answer to first order questions and we can be right or wrong about them. Uh, and all those ideas can be contested. Um, they were contested by the sentimentalist tradition, um, which was um, most importantly, I think, illustrated by the Earl of Shaftesbury, writing at the beginning of the 18th century, and then David Hume and Adam Smith, writing during the 18th century. Um, now they were both sentimentalists. They thought that ethics was not properly a subject of rational proof or rational um, uh, pressure. It was a subject of sentiment, of getting, if we could get our sentiments into the right shape, then we could um, answer any questions that needed answering about uh, which should be the things to encourage, which should, which should be the things that uh, we need to discourage, um, what kind of forms should society take or should our personal lives take. So the sentimentalist tradition was um, an attempt to say something about ethical discussion. And what it said about it was that um, fundamentally it's a question of expressing how to feel about things. Um, and that's what it's that's what we're voicing when we voice, you know, um, that some, something something is wrong, something is right, something's permissible, something's not. Um, that uh, meets um, <clears throat> resistance from people who think of themselves as rationalists and who want reason to be in the driving seat. They don't like the idea that it's all a matter of sentiment. And of course, there are lots of words that get thrown about in that kind of debate. Um, words like nihilism, um, skepticism, um, views that um, people associate with uh, sentimentalism are essentially rather like in the 16th century um, atheists were thought of as libertines, and um, in the 20, 20th and 21st century, um, sentimentalists were thought of as kind of little better than nihilists or relativists or skeptics, um, or the, um, the, the having the platform on which people were taking our positions. Okay, well. Before we get into some more specifics, I am just curious if you think that this is a sort of apt, maybe, way of putting the relationship between metaethics and ethics. When I, I took, or I sat in, on the beginning of a class about Husserl's phenomenology, and my professor said something like, after you take this course, you will see that all the rest of philosophy sort of is like a castle sitting on clouds. And that's how I think of ethics. I mean, if you don't address the meta-ethical questions that lie mm. beneath the ethical questions, then yeah. you have no grounds on which to trust what you are thinking yeah. or learning or studying in ethics. I think that's right, because um, you'd be thrown back on words like intuition. Oh, it's a man, I intuit the, the answer. I can just see that the answer is such and such to a first order question. I can just see that abortion is wrong, or I can just see that homosexuality should be forbidden, or whatever it might be. And um, that's not really a, a satisfactory. It's philosophically sort of spinning the wheels. Um, all, that, all that one learns is that you think that whatever it was and that you um, have no account of why you think you know it. So um, so I think that the, both sentimentalists and to some extent rationalists, I think to a lesser extent, attempted to explain the authority of ethics and the way it works in our lives. Sentimentalists do that by looking at the structure of our passions and sentiments are concerns, um, the rationalists do it or pretend to do it by talking about the structure of reasons. 
What I wanted to turn next to were your essays in quasi-realism. And I think since quasi-realism lies sort of in the middle of a spectrum of realism and anti-realism in value theory, I thought maybe we could start by discussing what these opposite ends are. So granted, I mean, you mentioned that there, there's there's controversy in these questions, in these metaethical questions and where to draw distinctions. But generally, what does it mean for you to be a moral realist? I think the prevailing image behind realism is um, that explanation comes from outside in. Now, let me explain outside that. In. Yeah. Um, if you ask why are we thinking in these terms or why are we thinking about one thing or another, uh, frequently the answer will be to cite a, um, what we see as a, as a fact about the world, something outside us, in response to which we think as we do. So to take the simplest sort of example, if you ask me why I believes that um, there's a house which is visible outside my window, my answer is really going to start with the fact that there's a house outside my window, Right. then proceed by my vision, which is pretty good in this respect, at least as far as my life so far has um, shown. Um, I'm successful at avoiding houses or going to houses, and I'll so I've got no reason to doubt my senses in this respect, and they tell me that there's the house outside by the window. That's what I would call an outside-in explanation. It says that we respond to, uh, we're responsive to the fact of the matter. It's a causal explanation too. The house plays a role in causing my belief that there's a house there. That is, if there wasn't a house there, I wouldn't believe it. Uh, that's the standard situation. You can cook up bizarre scenarios in which there's not a house there, but I believe there's a house there. But they're pretty outre. They're pretty um, unusual. They don't uh, they don't cross my mind. Um, similarly, if I stand at a bus stop and a bus is coming, I see that the bus is coming, and I respond to the fact that the bus is coming. And it doesn't cross my mind that I might be believing that there's a bus is coming, although there's not, or something that resembles a bus. So um, that's an outside-in explanation. You're starting off with a fact about the external world, and you're explaining why I believe that fact. Um, people have tried to adopt that model for other branches of thought, where the causal is. So a classic example is Platonism in the philosophy of mathematics, especially. Why do we believe that two plus two equals four? Well, because two plus two is four. Uh, the numbers are stacked that way, and we are responding to that fact. Well, that's a, a sort of parody of the explanation about the house or the bus. Because for the house or the bus, we have a, a grip. It may not be an entire grip, but it's a grip on the causal process. We know, for example, how we have to be positioned to respond to a house. You have to be sufficiently near it for your vision to operate, or a bus, or your, if, it, if not your vision because you're blind, then your other sense is some sort of auditory sense or tactile sense. So we know roughly how, how it is that we're responsive to the facts in those cases. In the case of mathematics, it's all very well saying we respond to the fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but you find it very difficult to sketch a mechanism. How does that work? What sort of things are numbers and what sort of thing is the way they're stacked? So that we are responsive in anything remotely akin to a causal way to any facts about numbers. So the Pla Platonist, who here is a card-carrying realist, tends to sort of go silent at that point and perhaps talks about things like intuition or reason 
which I think are just counters. They're just ciphers. They don't really do any explanatory work. Um, in mathematics, the alternative seems to be some kind of constructivism. That is, rather than responding to facts that are just there anyhow, we construct the whole theory of mathematics um, with a purpose in mind, namely the purpose of handling um, sizes of things, magnitudes, sizes of sets, sizes of um, uh, a geometrical figure and uh, configurations of geometry and so on. These things matter to us if we're building uh, houses or temples or whatever we might be building, and we have devised ways of coping with them. So that sees mathematics as essentially a construction of our own. So there you've got the constructivist versus the Platonist, and it's about directions of fit, of the best explanation of why we are thinking as we are, why we have the results we have, and why we... Um, perhaps why we can't think outside that particular box. So, so really, the realist, as I see it, is always wedded more or less to an outside-in explanation. The constructivist reverses it. It says it's an inside-out explanation. It's because we need to do something that we come up with the language we end up with, come up with the... Uh, theory we end up with, come up with the inferential patterns that we need to use, the logic. And um, and so that's the debate, and transferred to the philosophy of, man, of ethics, it's got a similar shape. The realist talks about an outside-in explanation. It's because it's a fact that murder is bad, that we think that murder is bad. The sentimentalist doesn't have any... Um, um, doesn't give any credence to that kind of explanation and substitutes the inside out. He says, well, we have the sentiment, we dislike murder because we see that it's important to human welfare and well-being that we are safe in our lives and if there's murderers about, we're not safe in our lives. So, of course, we, um, we try to isolate them or execute them or persecute them in some way. So, so again, you've got that opposite direction of explanation. So the, the sentimentalist then is the anti-realist in the, in the spectrum that I laid out? Yes. Okay, great. And yes. one other question I have before we move on maybe to quasi-realism is this talk of we were talking you talk about facts you frame this in terms of in terms of facts and which i take to be something like just true propositions maybe that's that's wow. what the facts are now you use the example the house is outside uh but just for purposes of explanation let's just use the house is red or five is prime as examples and these two propositions involve predicating something of an object, uh, wow. redness or or primeness. And right. when we say something like lying is wrong, we're predicating some sort of moral property to an act. Wow. And what, so I, granted that you're not a, a realist, yes. what sort of things are moral properties supposed to be like? I mean, I, I understand redness as a, a physical property, uh, yes. maybe uh, primeness as a relation to yeah. other numbers, uh, but yes. what, what sort of properties are moral properties supposed to be? Well, like? that's a question really for the realist. I wouldn't see, at okay. the beginning talk about right. moral properties. Right, right, right. Uh, but if you think that they hang out somewhere, tell me <laughs> where. Um, yeah. That is, the redness is there on the surface of the house, and that we know a lot about it. We know a lot about what it takes for a house to be red. It has to reflect red light um, preferentially across the spectrum. Um, the, um, the equivalent is, again, mysterious in the case of ethics. Um, I mean, the classic here was 
probably written in 1903, was G. Moore's book, famous book, Principia Ethica. Um, Moore was a Cambridge philosopher. He um, wrote Principia Ethica, which was to be the principles of ethics, of course. And um, in it, he came up with a dilemma, really, for um, people who think about moral properties. He went on thinking about moral properties, so he didn't think it was a fatal dilemma, but it did point to something. And the dilemma was you either think that moral properties are some version of natural properties, that is, they're open to empirical investigation and they belong to the causal order of things. They're the sort of properties that a natural scientist might be interested in, like having an electric charge or being a certain color. Um, that's naturalism. And Moore, Moore had an argument against naturalism. He said, no, you can't deal with moral properties like that because However extensive a natural description you give of some state of affairs, there's the remaining question. There's a question that remains open, which is, is it wrong or is it right? Is it a good thing? Is it not a good thing? So, you, I mean, to take a, an example, of the, well, the example that Moore himself was bothered by, um, suppose you are a... <clears throat> In first order ethics, you're utilitarian. So you think that the important dimension uh, to look at if you're evaluating whether something's good or bad or right or wrong is the amount of welfare or happiness, the surplus of welfare or happiness over um, pain or displeasure or disappointment uh, that it um, involves. And if the surplus is as good as it could be, then the thing is right. And if the surplus is not as great as it could be, then there's some better action which you should have taken. So the measure for the utilitarian is um, that balance of utility or balance of happiness, the usual sort of welfare might be a better word. Um, and Moore said, well, that's all very well. You know, that may be a rather admirable ethic, but it's a, there's an open question whether utilitarians have got this right. Yeah. And open question is, you know, very easily seen, as seen in every first, of, you know, first year ethics class. When you think about the dilemmas which could involve balances of um, utility, so suppose if more utility is to be achieved in some emergency situation um, by procuring the judicial execution of an innocent man, um, perhaps that will assuage the anger of the mob and they'll stop rampaging and it could restore order if you found a scapegoat. Um, but there'd be a very serious question about whether that was that that was a permissible thing to do. In other words, there are ways of achieving balances of utility which should be ruled out at the start. And many ethicists will say that. And even if you don't agree with them, you know what they're saying. They've got a point. They're not contradicting themselves as they would be if oh, creating utility was just the moral property. So denying that it's good to create a utility would be like contradicting yourself. It's not like that. The question is open. And um, Moore thought that that meant the moral properties had to be regarded as non-natural properties. And that, of course, raises its own problems because then um, what are they? How do we know about them? Why are we bothered about them? Surely utility and pain and pleasure and so on occupy the foreground of our concern. So why should the other things, um, you know, muscle in on the act? Um, and all these questions are left dangling by non-naturalism. So Moore's dilemma was naturalism or non-naturalism. Naturalism can't be right. Um, non-naturalism has to be the answer, but then not naturalism 
brings nothing but philosophical darkness. So, so that's where he left it. And for about the next 30 years, people struggled to find a way past that dilemma. Um, I think if they'd look back at Hume and Adam Smith, as I say, at the 18th century Scots, they could have answered more, but nobody seemed to think of doing that until the 1930s. Well, one last thing before we turn to the quasi-realism is, yeah. I wonder, so we've we've been framing this, again, in terms of moral facts, right and now. again, if we're treating facts as true propositions, a lot then hinges on what we think truth is, or how we should think of truth, and you've written a lot about truth as well, and, and so for instance, one one way in which I see truth as figuring into this is, for example, if we take a, a pragmatic approach to truth and right. what is true or the propositions that are true are simply the ones that are useful to believe, then for us, um, lying is wrong, just to use that example again, is we'll take that as true because it's useful to believe and then it's a it's a fact. The proposition is, uh, is true. Yeah. Uh, so we might want to be realists about it. If we take that approach to truth as the right one. So where do you see truth as fitting into this and the proper way of looking <laughs> at truth so as to uh, preclude a realist approach? Um, this is a very big question and uh, we, could, very we, could, big. we could sit on it for the next uh, half an hour or hour. Um, or a day or two. Oh, day or two. I mean, my own preferred approach to the notion of truth is what's known as deflationism. This started with Frager and again Frank Ramsey, Frank Plumpton Ramsey, and, um, uh, and has be beca subsequently become very popular. It's probably mainstream dominant, uh, yeah. And deflationism says, well, look. Don't think of truth as something, you know, special and important and mysterious in its own way. Um, to say, I mean, the problem of truth is really nothing more than the problem of what to believe. And the thing about that is, if you've got some proposition, you know, the house is colored or lying is a bad thing or whatever, um, the deflationist insight is that it makes no difference at all whether you say the house is colored, oh, let's, let's, say, let's say the house is colored red, um, or it's true that the house is colored red. Those two are equipotent. They, they, they mean the same thing, to put it crudely. Uh, they come to the same thing. If you can show that the house is red, you've shown that it's true that the house is red. Um, so again, if you say lying is wrong and somebody says, well, I'm not sure about that. I, um, I'm not sure that it's true that lying is wrong. Then they're saying, I'm not sure that lying is wrong. The introduction of truth is in the sense of fifth wheel. It, it's, um, it's not getting things into gear. Um, and you can just plug along without mentioning truth for, you know, a long way. Certainly if you've got particular identified propositions, to say they're true is just to reassert them. So there's uh, Peter Strawson, a distinguished philosopher of the middle of the 21st century, um, said that uh, instead of it's true that, you might as well say ditto. Well, that goes for me too, yes. okay. but ditto will do. So you could say um, it's true that Biden, Biden is a great president, and if I'm a good Democrat and I agree with you, um, I might say that's true, or I might just to say ditto. Well, that goes for me. Yeah, I'm on board with that, um, signifying agreement. Um, so basically what truth fundamentally does is signifies agreement with a, an identified thesis or proposition. If there's no thesis or proposition identified, then um, it's a little more complicated. But basically what it comes to is 
we don't know what the truth is about this means we don't know what to believe. We don't know what to put forward or to assert or to act upon. So we have no no handle on things. We don't know what the truth is. The um, the pragmatist element comes in because um, deflationism about truth is often thought of as a kind of pragmatist stronghold, yeah. pragmatist thesis. Frege wasn't a pragmatist actually, but um, still, um, but still, it becomes the typical property of pragmatists. And the pragmatism is, is it transfers itself to thinking about belief. Um, why do beliefs matter? Well, they matter because they're the basis of action. So truth of belief is intimately connected with success in action. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, But truth, again, kind of drops out. It's rather that when you're asking what to believe, you're, in effect, wondering what is going to be the most successful basis for action. It's not quite as simple as that because some false beliefs um, by devious methods give successful bases of action. Um, um, the false belief that you're the most popular person in the class may be a, a route to success in life, um, but it's false for all that. Um, so so, the, so it's not as quite as simple as that, but there's got to be some intimate connection between um, what to believe and how successful life will go. Um, and we all see that in simple con contexts. If you, um, if you believe that 12 twelves are 130, you get the wrong number of tiles for your room and you know, make a mess of decorating it. Um, and so on. So, so that's, that's obvious. Um, the, uh, Deflationist, once he, once he feels he's got truth under control, because um, because it's uh, it, in a, it's in a sense dissolves in any questions about truth dissolve into questions about what to believe. Then it turns out the truth isn't the private property of realism, because basically what we say about truth has nothing to do with the direction of explanation I talked about earlier, where realists have an outside-in direction of explanation and uh, constructivists or sentimentalists have an inside-out direction of explanation. turns out the truth has got nothing to do with that. Um, truth, truth just goes by the by. And um, that became, um, I mean, when I first started writing about this, and even as late as Essays in Quasi-Realism, which was 1984, if I remember rightly, or maybe it was later, actually. Anyhow, never mind. Um, the, uh, I was sort of wedded to some kind of, um, if not a correspondence theory of truth, at least something that gave a rather chunky role to the idea of a fact. Um, and so... Um, uh, and so it was. It took me several years, um, partly as, as a result of Paul Horwich's great little book, Truth, um, and uh, also the writings of people like uh, Quine, who was a deflationist, um, uh, to start to well um, to uh, um, wean myself towards. A deflationist view of truth, and that does alter things. Um, if we get on to quasi-realism, shall we? Um, oh yes, want... yes. But well, actually, um, one thing that you said that I just—it kind of takes us a little afield, but I think it'll be a brief response yeah. before we go to quasi-realism. You yeah. quasi—I don't want to take on your accent. I say quasi-realism. So, um, yeah. uh, so yep. for, you said that. Uh, Frege, I mean, deflationism about truth begins with Frege. And mm -hmm. as I recall, however, 
Frege believed that all propositions referred either to the true or the false. And that might just be a strange artifact of translation. But if he thinks of truth and the true and the false as objects in this sense, Mm -hmm. it seems like he would be uh, not just not a deflationist about truth, but in some serious way, uh, a realist about. Well, it does sound like that. I quite yeah. agree. Okay. Uh, the deflationist writings of Frege on truth are slightly late, slightly later. Okay. On the um, uh, of sense of reference and the the work when he um, he had this image of. Um, all true sentences referring to the same thing, the true. Yeah. Um, he never did any work with that. He never told you what this abstract object, the, the truth value, the true or the false, was. So it was possible that it was just a flowery, a rather abstract way of making a point. Frege did think there was some important equivalence between all true sentences, um, and and uh, um, and by putting that in terms that they all refer to the same thing, he was certainly, I think, making that point. I don't think he had a a pronounced Platonism that there was something there, even at the early stages of his or earlier stages of his career when he was saying that kind of thing. Um, I think the uh, the essay in which he is most markedly a um, deflationist seems to be The Thought, which was written in, I think, about 1905, six, something one there. Um, in later work, he became very, I mean, in the essays written towards the end of his life, he became very perplexed by the notion of truth. He, he thought it tries to do something impossible, and um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about what that what that was. But um, I don't think he ever satisfied himself entirely of, with any one theory. That may be simplifying things to call calling to call Frege himself a deflationist, right? But, but certainly the discussion, the thought, gave people a lot of ammunition for deflationism, a lot of, um, uh, put a lot of punch into the notion. Because basically what he did was say, if you believe that it's true that P has a different sense, it means something different because, than P, just the simple proposition, if you believe that it's true that there's a cat on your lap, means something different from there's a cat on your lap, then what about it's true that it's true that there's a cat on your lap? Has that got a different sense again? Or it's true that it's true that it's true that it's true that there's a cat on your lap? Are you ascending a ladder of um, ever-increasing complexities? Um, And that's just incredible. You're not. You're just running on the spot. So you might as well stop at the first step and say there's a cat on your lap. Uh, and that's the um, uh, that's the fundamental, you know, weapon that Frege has in the essay, the thought, and I think it's a it's a very very important one. Okay, no, that that was that's very helpful. But now I I won't hold you back from uh, qu- quasi realism anymore. Okay. So where does this fit between anti realism, the sentimentalist, and realism? Well, I think it is basically um, best thought of as a piece of weaponry for sentimentalism. Okay. I I think that, um, yes, all these isms, I I actually kind of regret the terms, although I know I've landed with it, quasi-realism. Okay. Um, You regret uh, that term, or you regret realism and anti-realism as well? Well, yeah, I regret the term because it's, implies that we can use realism as a landmark and right. describe something as being like it, quasi. 
And I now no longer think we can use realism as a landmark because I think realism has too many fractured, problems. It's mm. fractured okay. into fragments, actually. It's fragmented. Um, so the way it goes is this. Um, when I started thinking about this in about well, way back in the 1970s, um, 50 years ago, um, it was fairly clear that expressivism wouldn't work to many to many philosophers. Oh, could you say what expressivism is? Yeah, expressivism is just the view that in it's not quite as determinate as sentimentalism, although sentimentalism is a a um, a species of expressivism. It's the view that the primary semantic anchorage, if you like, the primary thing to say about the meaning of a, a ethical remarks um, is that they express a state of mind of some sort. Hume called it a passion, um, but he had to sort of, in a sense, back three of calm passions, passions which had no phenomenology, no feel about them. And that means that the word passion seems to go by the board a bit. And, um, and I think what he had in mind was more like attitudes. And that's the word I liked using. Alan Gimard, who works in very much the same vein as me and quite independently and very brilliantly, he, um, he, he liked to think in terms of plans, expression of plans. So if you say um, you ought to be nice to your children, it would be equivalent to announcing or expressing a plan that people be nice to their children. That's the way you'd like the world to go. Just as if you plan to go on holiday, you know, to Greece this summer, that's the way you, you know, intend to bend the world. It, uh, the way you intend to behave in such a way, you intend to behave in such a way that um, you go to Greece this summer. So uh, we could talk about attitudes or plans. People talked about emotions sometimes. Other people talked about passions, as I say. But although the 18th century used the catch-all term sentiment, even that isn't quite right because you can have a plan in a very clinical state of mind. You don't have to have a feeling particularly. Um, so, oh, just as you can issue a prohibition without any kind of um, animus about it, um, you know, the city council can say only cars with even number number plates can use the city on uh, city roads on you know Sundays or something. And maybe a, um, a a law or rule that they issue, um, that's something they plan to enforce. They it needn't be accompanied by a strong feeling. In fact, it would be very odd to feel strongly about odd or even number plates. So, so all these words tend to be a bit difficult, and expressivism has come down and it's the general core that they're all sharing, because they're all saying it's inside out. It's what you're expressing that gives your moral remarks their fundamental identity, their meaning. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for derailing you. I just, I, I tend to think, I tend to prefer not to leave key terms undefined oh, as we're going oh, you're, along. You're very wise. You're very wise. And I, th th I appreciate that. <laughs> Now, the problem is that um, uh, the problem is I only have oh only another you know rather short time, so yeah. I I tend to race a bit, which is a which is bad. But uh, anyway, so how did a, a dissatisfaction with expressivism lead toward the the quasi realism? Well, it was often called non cognitivism, meaning you there was nothing to con cognize, there was nothing to know. And um, you can see why it was called that, because knowing is probably thought of as having its home in the red house or the bus coming down on you. You see it and you know it. Um, and 
and after more, there was no such simple epistemology attached to realism in ethics. Um, so, um, um, but realists have said, still, we have an ace up our sleeve. We and we alone are allowed to talk of, say, knowing that it's um, right to be uh, to bring up your children with kindness. We and we alone know that it's true that murder is wrong. We and we alone know. And then everything that implies the category of fact or truth um, or reason, we alone have that kind of um, vocabulary at our disposal, says the realist. So expressivism might be all very well as a kind of woolly sketch, but it doesn't do justice to the form that moral convictions take. They take the form of factual conviction. And that's something that expressivists deny or can't cope with. So my simple suggestion was, yes, we can. <laughs> uh, that is, um, we can give a perfectly credible um, imitation, if you like, that was the quasi bit, of everything the realists think is their own private property. property. So, for example, if I say I know that it's better to bring up children with kindness than with harsh discipline, say, um, I'd say, well, look, that's my conviction. This is the view I'm going to express. Um, and furthermore, um, claiming that I know it acts as a kind of stop valve. There's nothing else to discuss. There's no, uh, no opposition. And this is another expression. Uh, I'm expressing the view that no opposition is likely to, or no credible opposition is likely to make me change my mind about this. As far as I'm concerned, it's done and dusted. And I express that by saying, I know, I know. That's what you always express by saying you know something. It's not an idiosyncratic um, take on knowledge. Um, now, of course, you can be wrong. That is, you can say that something's done and dusted, or you can think that something's done and dusted. Uh, well, it's not. Um, and you, you are... Um, premature, you've, um, you've closed your mind, and that's not always a good thing. But it's sometimes a good thing. Uh, if you know that the bus is coming, good to close your mind to doubt, because um, doubt might lead you to step out in the road to see whether it's really coming. That would be fatal. So, um, so in everyday cases, there are certainly cases where it's a good thing to claim knowledge. And I claim to say it is a good thing to claim knowledge about bringing up children, that it's better done with kindness than with a harsh discipline. So um, somebody else may disagree, some benighted person in my view, but um, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is. Um, so my view was that um, uh, um, that the argumentation which uh, went on, in which expressivists were called non-cognitivists and um, realists were alone capable of saying the things we might want to say in moral discussion, that that was just not true. Uh, expressivists could say it per with a perfectly good conscience. We're not stretching anything. Of course, if deflationism about truth, in a sense, opens the door to that, quite obviously, because then as soon as you've got the belief or the attitude, um, you can add the word it's true that with for free. And if you can add yeah. that for free, you can add the rest. So that's... Um, that was the um, evolution of, of quasi-realism, if you like. That's the way it was born. And um, 
Alan Gibbard was thinking along very similar lines in in Michigan when I, I met him in the early 80s and and then we sort of worked in parallel, independently, but in par- parallel. I think that a, a problem, maybe some people don't think of it as a problem, but something that very little attention is paid to in contemporary analytic philosophy is the important question that uh, preoccupied a lot of ancient thinkers, which is, well, what are we supposed to do? How should we live a good life? And presumably, if we're realists, we have at least some hope of, and granted that realism is fragmented, but we have some hope of finding a code by which to live that is grounded in some sort of fact. Though, of course, whether we ultimately want to be utilitarians or something else is another matter. But how is the quasi-realist supposed to make the sorts of decisions that press themselves upon us as being moral in our experienced life when on a philosophical level they take there to be no facts of the matter? Well, of course... um... In the presence of deflationism, it's not quite right to say that at any level, philosophical level, um, we take there to be no facts of the matter. I just I gave you an example. I claim not only that I know that it's better to give ch- to bring up children with kindness true, and, true. and not with harsh discipline, um, but of course I'm perfectly in, capable of saying it's a fact. You know, if the way to think. Um, I want you to say ditto to that. That goes for you too. And if you don't, we're in disagreement. Just as my wife and I are in disagreement if I plan that we go to the mountains and she plans that we go to the seaside. Um, That's a disagreement in plan. And we can have disagreements in planning how to live and in in, um, encouraging different this and that and the other in living. Now, I think it's very important that the problems of first-order ethics, how to live, what code of conduct to, you know, lay down in letters of gold, um, is no harder for the sentimentalist or the expressivist than it is for the realist, because the reality, um, it's like the voice of God. It's unfortunately extremely absent. It doesn't... It doesn't... Um, impinge in the same way on everybody. Some people take God's voice to tell them that women shouldn't get educated. Uh, other people don't. And um, so on across the board. It's the same with realism. Realism is a good thing to, as it were, um, uh, to pretend. Well, I don't really want to use the word pretend, but it's it maybe it's, it's maybe it's a nice cloudy vision, um, but it doesn't actually deliver the bacon. It doesn't actually give you the words to write in gold. It because you can be a realist and you can think like Immanuel Kant that if the mad axeman comes to the door and asks where your children are, you've got to tell him because it's a wrong to tell a lie always. Um, whereas other people think that uh, the mad axeman comes to the door and asks for your children and asks your duty to lie to him. Um, so, you know, it's not, an, and there's no good saying, oh, well, I'm a realist, so I happen to think one of those things because the, oh, I'm a realist, so it's doing no work. It's not giving you the outside in explanation realism really demands. The realism, I think, is a busted flush. It's a pretense theory rather than a a real help to any problems of living or how to live. Um, It it doesn't even suggest that there's a unique solution to those problems, never mind about what it is, because it's quite possible that there are several solutions. no, realism doesn't preempt that. Um, so, so I think that you know, as far as the 
progress or absence of progress of first order theorizing about ethics goes, I don't think realism really uh, is a help. If anything, and this has been, this has been argued recently quite um, cogently in the journals, not by me, but by people I know, um, it, may, it may even get in the way because um, rather like the word of God, um, it can distort practical reasoning. Um, when people thought that theism was very important for morality, if you were going to be moral, you had to believe in the word of God. The difficulty was knowing why. Why is it? Why bother? And the answer was, well, because God will slug you if you don't. Um, but then that's that's uh, in the famous phrase of Bernard Williams. That's one thought too many. So if I um, if I'm minded to um, uh, steal your money, um, I a good person would think that that's the wrong. That's that's awful. I can't do that. I can't. I can't just steal your money. It's not on. Um, if a religious person thinks, well, I'd like to steal your money, but God might slug me if I do. Uh, that's having one thought too many, because it, then it becomes a, a question of fear. Well, it shouldn't be a question of fear. It should be a question of just, here I stand, I won't do it. It's not the sort of thing I do. I'd even say things like, I'd let myself down if I did it. But s saying that, you know, somebody will punish me if I do it is childish. And it's introducing the wrong kind of um, consideration. It's, um, to use a, an analogy, it's like the husband who comes home and kisses his wife because he feels he ought to, as opposed to he wants to. And that's the wrong kind of marriage. <laughs> yeah. The wrong object of concern. So, um, so I think that um, realism can actually get in the way of well-tuned and appropriate sentiments, well-tuned and appropriate feelings about things. Um, well, granted that for the purposes of our conversation now, I think we've 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 settled the second order questions. Sure. I am curious about how, in your own life. I mean, you you know that lying is wrong. You 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 know that it's it's better not to raise your children violently. But how do you settle these first order questions as they come up in your life? Do you have a preferred theory, or are you relying on intuitions? I think what I rely on, and I think what fundamentally everybody relies on. Um, is a learned, inherited cultural background. Um, now, we can discuss it. It's, it doesn't have to be wooden or automatic or sort of ingrained in any serious way, but asked about um, almost any sort of behavior, um, you'll have a sense of what decency requires, what what what's required of being a neighbor, being a parent, being a, um, being a philosopher, being a professional academic. Um, and you'll um, very naturally think that some behaviors are okay and others are not. So if you're a conscientious a academic, you read your students' papers, you mark them as you best you can, you don't um, ask the um, attractive members of your class to sleep with you for extra marks, um, and you don't um, do a hundred similar things. You don't uh, shout and spit at them if they uh, make a mistake. Uh, these are things which common decency, you might say, demands. 
And I think we all inherit a background of common decency, which has its effect on nearly all of us. When I say nearly all, we have to make allowance for people who have psychopathic tendencies, um, people who have, have violently antisocial tendencies, uh, people who are, have violently criminal tendencies. So, of course, there's um, there, there's always the uh, you know the fallen human nature to contend with. But for over a huge spectrum of things, anyone you're likely to find yourself talking with is going to share a great many um, inherited beliefs. Now, it's interesting, of course, that those may be historically very conditioned. Um, and this was something that bothered the moral philosopher, um, borrowed, bothered Nietzsche a great deal. And then it bothered Bernard Williams um, in, in our own times. Uh, because the historical contingency of the way we come to behave, the ways we've come to regard as acceptable, um, does, I think, have a kind of slightly perturbing or destabilizing effect. We'd like to think that throughout history, everybody's been more or less like us. Uh, when we learn that that's not true, we, um, we may become a little... Um, Maybe in education we become a little less complacent. Um, we might learn that the fortress of our present-day morality needs a care and attention, needs more, um, more vigorous fertilizing than we're apt to give it otherwise. So it's a fragile growth, and um, and maybe a lucky growth. In the sense, I mean, take for example a, um, uh, I, I think something which 99%, even the psychopaths in America probably agree with, which is that slavery was a bad thing. Um, sure, we all think that. How does it come about that a century and a half ago, very few people thought it? Um, and then we might. We might give a more or less um, convincing historical story about that. One of which is that 150 years ago, all the world's work practically had to be done by animal muscle, whereas now we have machines. Um, did that make a difference? Was that the difference? I mean, this is this this is an issue for historians, but learning about the contingency of our present ethics is, I think, a very salutary prelude to knowing how they should be cherished and how they should be, um, you know, uh, developed or grown. Yeah, yeah, it definitely points the, points the way to progress mm. or leaves the door open for it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Simon, this has been the most terrific introduction to meta-ethics that Robinson's podcast I could have hoped for. So thank you so much for talking with me. Love that. Very pleased. <laughs> thank right. you. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not <laughs> joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats. Please do so.